My name is Frippy Jimmerson. I'm a figurative and equine sculptor. I originally lived in London and I trained at Camberwell College of Arts and City and Guilds of London and I spent a little bit of time in Portland in the Sculpture Trust there, just learning a bit about stone carving. And then I moved to Edinburgh um, where I worked from very small studios and I worked on and off in other jobs as well. Um, because it wasn't enough to fund myself as a sculptor. When I moved to the Borders, I had this big studio which I converted and that was my opportunity to start making bigger work and focus just on equine and figurative works. I worked mainly in clay, uh, wet clay for the larger pieces and then a, a, a waxy clay called plastiline for the smaller ones. And that means I can make lots of pieces, um, leave them open and then move back onto the commissions and back onto them from time to time. This piece here is a piece that just come back from Powder Hall Bronze Foundry in Edinburgh. Um, there's a massive team. I've known them for about 15 years and they're, they're very generous with their time. Uh, they, they've taught me many skills like patination and also it's just good to be part of a, a sculptural community. The owners are both sculptors and many of the people who work there are sculptors too. So this is raw bronze. I'm going to patinate it next week. It's a Swiss horse. Um, the, the owner's uh, Swiss. Uh, and she asked me to, to sculpt her horse. It's life size, it's an ex race horse. He was in the Hong Kong Jockey Club and that's where she bought him. Then she transported him over to Switzerland and he's now in retirement. That, I did this in lockdown, so that was my last commission to be completed. And well, once it's finished, that'll be great and I can move on to my, my next things. This is my own work, it's going to be um, a figure on a horse, it's life size. I usually work from life, but of course I can't have a horse in the studio. Sometimes I bring one and I tie it up outside, especially when I'm getting to the detail. But to complete something as big as this, I usually do a small maquette first and then um, size it up. This is another piece of my own, which is not on commission, it's just something that I'm working for. It's uh, the co cobalt blue, is really not, not there for the colour, it's more there for the way it wraps around the form and the way it silences the form. Um, when I was at Art College in London, uh, Anish Kapoor was, um, had a huge exhibition in the Hayward Gallery and the way that he used colour on his pieces was, um, was very informative to what I want to do in the future. Um, that muffled um, sense of colour is what I'm looking for. So that piece eventually will have a, a perspex cast, glass case, perspex case around it, and then I'm hoping to block it out with other colours. So it's just a silhouette within it, but they're always changing. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. Um, so these are some of the tools that I use. Uh, this is the clay that I was saying about. It's called plastiline. It's quite an expensive clay, but it just means you can leave these. These are some pieces I've just started, and it means I can leave them out. Um, whereas if you use wet clay, this is the wet clay I use to do bigger pieces. It means you have to wrap it, so it's not so good if you want to come back to things, but it's much cheaper. And these are some little tools that I, that I collect. These are called griffin hooks, and they're brilliant for small pieces. Um, and I use a shop called Taranti in London for these, but you can get some good ones online. Italian ones seem to be the best modeling. I make my armatures out of aluminium um, armature wire and I use these uh, uh, are not scaffolding, the ones that you're guttering. I use these are guttering, aluminium guttering fixings and it just gives you a really nice solid base and when I put my armature into a figure I try to do it on the least, in the place that's least going to obstruct from my modeling and then when the mold is taken it just means um, they don't have to re remold it in the wax or I don't have to remold it in the wax when it's being cast. These are all some of the molds I make. So when I um, cast a piece in a silicon mold, the foundry make the mold for me. Um, I can make molds, but it's really, uh, it takes a lot of patience and I don't have that kind of skill really to make a really good mold. So they make those silicon molds for me and then I test cast bits and pieces just to see how they're going to come out and I use plaster. So this is a piece of um, the elbow and leg of a horse um, of one of my bronze sculptures and I had so many of these lying around my studio so I've decided to set them into plaster and I make these moulds. A lot of people use moulds um, with pieces of wood and then they 
put clay around the edges to stop the plaster. When you pour the plaster, it's obviously very liquid, so it can spill out. But I found a new way to do it. I'm sure lots of other sculptors do it. But it's new to me of just using a glue gun. So it absolutely seals everything. And then I just knock out these. If I hold that up, you can see that that's the mould set in. And it's not finished at the moment, but I'll take some more plaster, fill in all the, all the air bubbles and any gaps that I don't like. And then after that, I'll smooth it down using a wet and dry method, which is this kind of um, uh, sandpaper. This is a fabric sandpaper, which is the best because it doesn't dissolve in the water and it lasts for ages. It doesn't rub away. So I'll just cover, cover it in water, dip it in, and then polish over the, over the piece until it's really, really smooth. It just gives it a really fine finish. And this plaster is, you can use any kind of plaster, but uh, fine white casting plaster is more for mold making, but to set it into um, a mold so it's very hard, use a dental plaster, which you can get um, all over and online and things like that. So that's that.